We're very pleased to be joined by Mike Gonick, CEO of Hack DefNet, and we're going to be looking at uh, cyber risk intelligence, the ISOC, and uh, essentially how it plugs into the MSP MSS of tomorrow. How are you doing, Mike? Oh, pretty good. How about you? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm loving being in the Great Lakes. Um, I, I. I think it's a nice place. Lovely people. <laughs> it's just. Uh, it's just uh, such such a broad place. But I think we've we've found uh, quite a few uh, things to, to notice about it. No, most notably, manufacturing and industrial center of the North American region. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some pretty interesting discussions going on too, like you said, in Discord. So it's always interesting to have different views of things and um, having those discussions that probably hopefully adds value to some of the attendees today. So we'll see. Perfect. Well, you have the floor. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, so um, my name is Mike. I'm uh, the CEO of HackDevNet and uh, um, HDN uh, in, uh, International Incorporated. I'm also a doctoral researcher at Harrow at Watt University, uh, studying some of the different types of dynamic attacks that are going out uh, in there in social media, uh, as well as other places from nation states and proxies. So with that, um, let me get right into things. Um, the top six vectors right now that we're, oops, that we're talking about are um, basically email phishing attacks, social media breaches as a service, attacks as a service exploit markets, espionage tools, social engineering, supply chain, disinformation, fake science, and deep fakes. The three that I'm going to concentrate on today because they're um, some of the most difficult ones to detect. They're currently not the ones that we see uh, being identified in any real way, shape, or form from artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I'll get to that why they're not uh, recognizing that in a few minutes. So social media, open source intelligence that's gathered from social media and open sources, as well as CVEs, which are exploited uh, servers that we find in cloud infrastructure, in a lot of the distributed cloud environments that people are using today and during the pandemic to connect with their companies. Unfortunately, it's one of the best avenues of attacks that are being used. Um, social engineering and supply chain attacks, I think a lot of people are finally starting to talk about this. I've been talking about this for at least the last 10 years. Um, it looks like I'm no longer the pariah in the crowd I'm, and, and I'm basically part of the crowd. So that's fantastic as a researcher to finally be part of a crowd <laughs> and not the geek. So the last one is, and this keeps me up awake at night, is disinformation, fake science, and deep fakes. These are the type of attacks that are leveraged by nation states and proxies that are very sophisticated that use different avenues through social media and open source intelligence on you, the target, to send you disinformation, to basically uh, manufacture fake science, to push public discussions and destabilize environments, and also deep fakes, which is fake audio and fake video by taking pictures of you or your audio and then turning that into a new file and trying to blackmail you or making it look as if you did something when in reality you are never even close to that environment or whatever it is that they're saying you said you never actually said. So why are we talking about this? Breaches and risks in 2021. Um, analysis was done at the beginning of the year and it's still ongoing and lo and behold, uh, the cloud services from Azure, from Amazon, uh, from Google, as well as SourceForge and GitHub are the five top ways that apps use to infect your devices, your smartphones, your embedded devices, IoT devices, smart meters, and all that kind of fancy stuff that we're depending on to do work in a connected city, connected environment. Um, but also to connect to our um, different types of companies from home offices, these are the things that are being used and targeted by nation states and cybercrime syndicates to infect your smartphones, tablets, um, mobile PCs, laptops, etc. Another thing when we're talking about mobile smart, uh, phones or smartphones or tablets is we have um, various different companies out there that basically copy APKs, which are in this case Android apps. Uh, they copy them from uh, legitimate websites or third parties and they basically copy and insert their backdoors and malicious code into this. And in September, um, the uh, uh, Department or Ministry of Defense um, in a specific European country did resource, uh, research on this. And they found that Huawei, um, Xiaomi, and also OnePlus telephone companies 
are basically doing this and modifying APKs with their own code um, and distributing this through Chinese-based servers um, or servers uh, in uh, European countries in the US, but in reality, they're, being, uh, they're owned by these Chinese manufacturers and they install uh, malware and malicious code on your phones. Um, not kind of cool, uh, actually. Um, so why are we talking about this? Because there's other technology that is currently also being used, and these are trackers and tracers. Um, it used to be something that was legitimate to basically monitor the different types of applications that you're using to make sure that if you ran into an issue, they knew where the issue happened and they captured information from your device and then they send it back to the manufacturer so that they could publish a patch or an update. But this has turned into another source of income that cybercrime syndicates and nation states use to infect devices. So how does this work? It collects analytics, GPS locations, activities, personally identifiable information through the apps that you install and through the services or in servers that are used to basically capture all your communication, install keyboard loggers, and all that nice fancy stuff that you don't want to have and probably aren't even aware that you have that basically spy and take pictures of everything and audio files and record everything that you do on your mobile devices. Not cool. The issue is though that a lot of these things, um, when they're pseudo legitimate, they are based off of vulnerable architecture and servers that are based on the cloud, which is already being used by nation states to spy on you and to install spyware and drive by downloads. So the very same trackers are using the same infected servers that are already trying to infect you with their stuff and they steal the data from these trackers and tracers. So in effect, they're breaching um, the privacy of these different types of trackers and tracers. Um, they're not publishing it to the users because you're not supposed to know that they're spying on you. And by the way, did I mention it's illegal? Um, so the data that's on these servers gets sent to these different nation states or the cybercrime syndicates. They attempt to install other things like nice spyware that will basically take care of the rest of the data that they don't really have on you or your family. Or they also try to connect to command and control servers to push narratives, to push posts on Instagram and all the other social media as you, when in fact it wasn't you. Some nice surprises. That data, that information, that intellectual property is stolen. Uh, they also install ransomware and infect these devices. And um, it's no longer a point where these different things are used for intelligence but they're used for infection and delivery of malware and spyware uh, in very illegitimate ways that are currently not being tracked the way they should be. And it's not only the apps, it's also social media. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all these nice, fantastic avenues of information that you depend on for your fake information, um, your information, um, these things are basically the very same tools that have trackers and tracers like the, uh, the Facebook Pixel that are capturing this information even with iOS 15.01 or 02. Why are we talking about this? Um, this information is used to target you in many different ways. And some of the ways that it's used to target you is by disinformation and fake science, uh, which is another big threat vector that's being used by nation states and interest groups. Unfortunately, Facebook and all the other social media companies aren't interested in controlling the information because they want to make money. So greed basically powers these different types of things, uh, unfortunately, that leads to the demise of many smaller countries that don't have intelligence agencies that are big enough to deal with this problem. And even the United States and the European Union can't effectively deal with this because Facebook is now deciding to change its name um, in a smoke and mirrors policy. Uh, to keep on doing the same thing that it's doing and to destabilize um, the way we live on these social media platforms. So a lot of websites out here, and I took one of them called abcjournals.net, which is supposed to be a, some academic journal. I took a look at the server. It's based off of a lease web server that's in the Netherlands. Um, it's known to be hosting malware. It has a bad reputation, meaning it attacks sources. Um, and it's a shared server that other companies may be using that are legitimate, but aren't even aware of this. So when you have these types of things, 
even if you're using a shared server, which is a big problem in cloud infrastructure, it leads to even more levels of threats uh, besides the fake uh, science and disinformation that is being pushed and sold um, as advertising on Facebook and social media. So it's an interesting cycle that does this. So to talk a little bit more about uh, disinformation and fake news, here's a small video to bring this point home. When people think of cybersecurity, they think of computers, smartphones, tablets, IoT devices, and other electronic components. And then they think of the cyber attacks that can compromise or destroy the services and or these gadgets. But security is much more comprehensive. It includes many different aspects, such as physical security. With most people getting their news from websites or social media, the way that people have digested information and gotten the situation of any given moment in time has relied on many new channels of information. With these new channels of information, it has unfortunately now become easier more than ever to spread propaganda, false information, fake news, and other types of disruptive media to the masses. Unfortunately, this can be done to disrupt the political system, a nation, an interest group, or anything else in order to influence dissent, create disruptions for a certain political party or an interest group, or simply to change the dynamic of a country and get them prepared for an invasion. These types of systems and the way that they are used to disseminate propaganda are becoming more and more dangerous. And unfortunately, many new generations that are depending on these new types of social media and different types of electronic information do not understand a lot of the risks involved in what is propaganda and disruptions from different enemy nation states. Unfortunately, this avenue is a relatively cheap and low-risk form of warfare, which is comprised of hybrid warfare that uses non-traditional ways to wage warfare in the electronic age. This is why it is now the number one tool used against political adversaries and other types of adversaries against an interest group or a nation state. It can be very easy and as basic as creating creative news or fake news stories online on numerous social media platforms and blogs. This piece of information or these numerous social media platforms and blogs are used to create a narrative that is not the truth. It can also be more complex, such as sending disruptors to hijack peaceful protests and also turn them into violent riots. Riots that can completely decouple a normal way of life in a given nation state. The examples of these are more than prevalent in the news today and in you, the reader or viewer's mind. We only need to take a look at some of the things about Black Lives Matter and these different types of platforms being misused by various different nation states to coordinate violent activities. The only way that you can detect that either you or your company or your country are targeted is to collect information using the information life cycle or intelligence life cycle to understand what it is that you're looking at, how these things are coordinated, and how to compare what fake is in relation to the truth. This is becoming much, much more difficult today than it was in the past. We have to filter out information that is propaganda, or at the very least is not telling us what is really happening, but is shaping a fake narrative and turning it into what people are starting to believe as reality. We have to find credible sources of data, information, and constantly fact check them against everything that we read, see, hear, or view on the internet. Think of a world where you cannot trust any major news source or any type of online media in any way, shape, or form. Think about what that society is like. 
not trusting what you see, hear, or can view. We are very close to living in that world right now. What can we do about it? We need to take cybersecurity and defense seriously now. Now before it's too late. And we also need to make sure that the entire world knows what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Okay, so I think uh, that brings back the point home. Um, why is this important? Uh, we talked about um, that uh, disinformation and fake science is used um, to push narratives um, that the advertising systems and social media don't have a vested interest in controlling these things. Um, so this means we have to take matters into our own hands, not because we're vigilantes, but we have no other choice. So some of that is being done by services such as ours where we block fake science and we track these websites um, and we block them from ever hitting um, you uh, on your mobile device. So um, anytime you go on social media and you're trying to connect to these sites um, that are trying to push fake news, um, they're also trying to install keyboard loggers and other types of spyware and malicious code on your phones without you knowing about it. So there's multiple reasons why we have to block this and it's not the things that you think, for instance, we want to shape a narrative or we want to um, block one political party or another party. It's not that, it has nothing to do with politics, it's just dangerous. So why it's so dangerous is because this stuff is used in proxy warfare. And proxy warfare just means that we have so, somewhere, uh, a person in the middle that gets paid by a nation state or the attacker to attack you, the victim. So it's the nation state or the interest group, the proxy, the proxy does the attack on you, the victim. And this is part of the hybrid warfare cycle. So if you've seen the hybrid warfare cycle, people don't uh, send bombs anymore because it's too risky and it's too expensive. People use social media and uh, the cyber realm to basically push different types of narratives and lead you to websites that are copies of legitimate websites to uh, basically have you download stuff that installs keyboard loggers and spyware on your, on your devices and on your servers to, to attempt to steal your data, to do lateral movement in your network and to circumvent any security um, uh, operations that you have in a way, shape or form that's very nation state uh, espionage specific. So we're moving past classical attacks and towards more advanced things. And we need to understand this. So that leads me to the next thing. Why does machine learning not help us with these dynamic attacks? And that's because of point two. Point two basically states that qualitative uh, information and research means that we're looking at perceptions or the meaning or cultural factors of reality and how that reality is interpreted. That means that the different types of threats and risks that we see in our current environment are very dynamic in nature and they're not finite. They're very dynamic, they're very fluid, and they're not attached to any given theory or topic or attack signature that any known uh, company has today or is planning in the near future to implement in their machine learning. And they can't because this is one of the reasons why machine learning artificial intelligence doesn't work. It'll show you an IP that it knows, it'll show you a signature that it knows, but IOCs have a shelf life of a few minutes, maybe a half an hour, if you're lucky, a half a day. Um, and IPs, they could be shared resources that just basically mean, fine, you found an IP, that IP is basically a shared resource or it's a, um, a GitHub server or an AWS server that other companies use. You either have to block that to stop the attack from happening, which means other services may not work correctly because companies don't pay attention to this. It's a really, really big problem. So um, the limitations of machine learning and artificial intelligence are they encode the correlation, but they don't show the cause or the relationship of things on the same level or on different dimensions. So they're also not well suited for high level or symbolic reasoning or planning because they can't do that currently. Um, and because of this, it can't really secure the supply chain because your supply chain and the environment is dynamic. Half of it is qualitative, half of it is quantitative. Quantitative works with machine learning. It's, very, it's a very specific area, but qualitative doesn't because it's dynamic and it's symbolic. And machine learning is not symbolic. So why is this case? Because of multidimensional threat and risk theory. This is something that I coined back in 2015 after doing a lot of research for the last uh, 20 plus years. We discovered that just like the universe has multiple dimensions, threats and risks have multiple dimensions. 
Just like string theory, all material in the universe is connected, risks and threats are connected to each other, to different levels, to different risks, to different threats. Very simple. What does this actually mean? So um, I think Stellar Cyber had an example of how they uh, use their solution to map things out. Um, if we're taking some of that, things like the port scans or the DNS scan, they might have picked up the DNS scan, um, or the social media scan or new connection requests on LinkedIn, um, they may not be finding these things because they're rather symbolic and they're not finite. Also, uh, the different types of searches and darknet activities against a company that are done, they are very dynamic and you won't necessarily see this in machine learning and AI based um, cyber defense solutions. They can't do it because that's not what they were built to do. But this is the way attacks actually happen today. So we're always going to need a certain type of SOC. We're always going to need people that can interpret this stuff uh, because this dynamicness of attacks is gonna stay with us pretty much until we no longer need the internet. So that's not gonna be anytime soon. So there's different areas in here like privileged escalation. These things we can check with, an, with artificial intelligence. Um, we can't check if someone planted criminal data or framing a victim, that's more dynamic. Um, we can't um, find out if um, your uh, assets are staging area for new attacks until the attacks happen. And uh, we also can't really find out if they're spying and breaching your third, your third party is, um, that you work with in your supply chain. And they also can't necessarily always um, uh, stop the spread of propaganda or detect if disinformation is being used. These are the reasons why machine learning and artificial intelligence aren't working and they never will work. Uh, because they will never be able to really use symbolic reasoning in how they detect attacks. They do work for detecting port scans and finding out if your account was in some breach that was published somewhere. So it does help in, in some ways, but we need to understand where the boundaries are. And this is important not only for investments, but why we still need people on the floor or boots on the ground, right? So what are we doing with the solutions? We're connecting the dots. We're using people and we're using machine learning uh, where they're viable to connect the dots and uh, complete our complex use cases to compile information and data sources for the use cases so that we can turn that into data, which is then in turn into intelligence. So IOCs, I'm not gonna go into too much. You can, you can view this later on if you want to. Just email me if you want this portion of the presentation and I can send it to you. Um, IOCs have a limited shelf life. They look at specific things, um, but their shelf life is very quickly uh, expired. So some of the things like dynamic attack code is very difficult to track. Um, if attacks are detectable and what kind of side channels they're using, these are all things that are extremely difficult to understand for machine learning. But also things like um, when they're unknown factors, it's very tough for an algorithm to track that because it needs to know what to pay attention to. And even if you teach an algorithm something, if it's symbolic, that algorithm still can't learn that because that's not what they do, right? So are you an attack? Are you a disruption? Does it fit into the hybrid warfare cycle? There are certain pieces of information that we can collect as people and as socks and as services that we still need to deter and stop attacks. And this is not something exclusive to intelligence um, um, agencies. Actually, intelligence agencies and SOCs and CERTs, they work together quite a bit. So if you haven't heard that before, you have heard it. And if you want to verify that, just check out the different websites for DHS, FBI, um, NSA, um, and all the other types of uh, three-letter institutions that are out there, how they compile their data and what partnerships they have. So what do we do? We make security as simple as possible because we want to focus on the stuff where we actually need people and we want to make everything else very simple. So if you're an MSSP and you want to sell this to your customer, you have a single dashboard. Um, it doesn't integrate everything that you will ever need, but it integrates the things that can be uh, managed and automated in a way so that you can concentrate on the stuff that you actually need to focus on. So what are the assets? What are the firewalls or security appliances or agents or connections to your smartphones that you have? We have this in a very easy dashboard and we kept it simple because we don't wanna make this thing too busy. We wanna concentrate on what makes sense, what's important so that we can action, so we have action, right? 
Another thing is we offer ways of uh, detecting if we have risk intelligence on your email, on your IP version 4 or 6 IPs, or on your domains. Uh, we can tell you if we found something. We can tell you if we found CVEs if you allow us to scan that publicly reachable uh, domain or IP. Uh, and then we can send you that information back. And if you want, you can turn it into vulnerability management on a monthly basis. Make it very easy and simple. If you need agents like Mac OS, Windows 10, 11, Unix, Linux, Debian, Ubuntu, we have agents for that, that block without you needing a firewall. Um, it integrates all of our intelligence, both open source and closed source. Um, so if you've heard before, open source is enough. It's not. You need to verify open source with closed source to make sure that you eliminate as many false positives and false negatives as possible. Um, it's tough. It's an ongoing thing every day. We monitor more than 414 million active domains every day with attendance of, uh, that increases of about a million to 1.5 million domains each week. We have more than a subset of 1 billion domains that were active at any given time. Many of these are malicious and used by nation state actors. So um, on another uh, hand, we can also integrate all this intelligence and all these feeds without you having to worry about this stuff uh, by using uh, open source software like OpenVPNs. We send you a profile if you have a, a subscription. Right now we're selling them for 59 uh, euros a year per device uh, until December. Uh, next year they'll be going up to 99 per device. So it blocks everything that it needs to block. It breaks some of the services that you're using um, because a lot of these services are using infected servers from AWS, Google, and Azure. So if you're looking for a solution that really protects you against a lot of stuff, you need to understand that not all the services that you use are going to work the way you want them to because they're malicious. And this is one thing that people have to start learning. So if you're interested, we'll help you get this up and running. It takes about two, three minutes. Um, OpenVPNs is open source software. We didn't write it, but our code goes on top. And you can integrate this in any embedded device, any IoT device, any smartphone, any operating system. With that, let me open it up to questions because I think I'm over my time. Right, Phelan? Yeah, um, absolutely, a little bit, but, but, but I think, um... I had another video, but I'll put that on the YouTube channel so people have a reason to go to the YouTube channel. No, absolutely. Um, I'm just trying to read because there's some nice comments. Uh, Simon says, uh, we are all the geeks. I think that's reference to the other uh, comment. That's good. Um, Alex um, says, this will only become more critical. Mike made an excellent point. The level of information sharing amongst government agencies and allies is tremendous. It makes a huge difference. We have seen tremendous benefit where they have been active public and private sharing. The US government has publicly stated they want to pump up the information sharing industries. Um, I had a question, though. You mentioned before that certain smartphone manufacturers are routinely spying on you, and people might say, well, why does that matter? Well, the answer is they, they hand it off to organized crime, and then you're just repackaged as some juicy target. It's not only that. There's there's different use cases, right? So, I mean, I hear this argument a lot, and, and it's basically this victimization narrative that I can't do anything. Why should I even care? The reason mm -hmm. why you should care is because, first off, you don't know who has your information. Second off, a lot of us have families and we have kids to take care of. Um, when someone wants to attack you and you work for, um, for a DOD uh, supplier, typically the route that they use to uh, blackmail people is through family members. Now, um, if you don't protect your devices and your smartphone in basic ways that are simple um, and you don't implement these things, you don't know what can happen. And the thing is right now, everyone's pretty much running around using their phones in a state of blindness. And um, just saying, I have nothing to hide, um, it's still not gonna protect you against um, people that are spying on you. Because mm -hmm. what China, Russia, and, and Singapore, and other countries do that are not uh, based on our law system or the European law system, they can do whatever the frig they want. And if someone wants to blackmail you with a fake video or audio, that's new. The, that's the new attack cycle that's just starting to ramp up. So, I mean, they're going to be capturing your photos, your video, all kinds of stuff like that. And they'll even try to plant stuff on your devices. It's not just stealing information. It's framing you. 
So if you're an adversary and you're, so, you're talking about something and someone wants to frame you, this is absolutely a use case that can happen. Yeah, and, and, and I, I can, can totally see it. See it. And actually, actually I, on with my other hand, hand, in the physical security, security world, and you know, lots of extortion, extortion cases and and and, and kidnapping and ransom cases. Um, but obviously, there's quite sensitive. So Thomas Freeman has a question in the audience. He says he 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 thinks it sounds like um, fear and doubt with strong statements. It'd be useful to have some references and case studies. Now, that to me sounds like an offline conversation because a lot of these case studies, like if, if, I, if I showed you some people's children disappearing, you know what I mean? It, yeah. um, I, I, I think you should definitely connect with Thomas offline now if, if, if that works. Right. Yeah, we can definitely do that. And, and like I said, I'm not going to talk about those cases uh, online for obvious security reasons, but we have use cases. And some of the stuff that I'm compiling for um, the university that I'm at, um, we're dealing with specifically the, pay, the the cases of social media and why they're not really interested because it's an advertising based financial system. Um, and I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying the system is the way it is. And that's why we have to deal as private citizens by protecting ourselves because we have no other choice, right? So it's not just, okay, well, you know, the FBI is doing this. They can't trace down all this stuff. Um, even the, the NSA, uh, um, uh, NSA, excuse me, NSA and all the others, um, they can't, or MI6, MI5, they can't do all this information themselves because the information flow is too huge. And it doesn't protect citizens against the attacks that we're seeing that are ramping up now. So we have to do something. Indeed. Well, we are now over time. I've added your uh, email in the chat box, and I know you're very active um, on the Discord channel. So let's let's give you a big round of applause, and uh, please, uh, Thomas, do do connect to Mike uh, offline through that uh, through that email, um, and of course uh, on on Discord as well.